I'm putting pressure on the king side. My knight is good placed. He, uh, he is putting pressure on this f6 pawn and life is good. Then I thought... I love it. Life is good. When you have a position like this, the life should feel very good indeed. Hello, dear chess lovers. Today we are starting a new series on coach reacts to students' analysis. I ask my students, my subscribers on YouTube to send me their games where they analyzed their own games. Now they are speaking out loud while looking at their own games and the coach, Dr. John, will look at their analysis and I will give live feedback. The coach will react to my subscribers' analysis of their own games. Why are we doing this? Because analyzing our games is one of the most effective ways to improve. We gain information about ourselves and about our biases and a stronger player can give you good feedback. Not only about the moves, whether they are good or bad, but the reasons why those moves are good and bad. Okay, so that's a function of this series. If you like this format, please send me your ideas and your videos and your analysis, and I will get more of such games. I will begin with the first game today with Syed from Germany. Thank you so much, Syed, for sending me your video analyzing one of your recent games rapid games that you played was 45 minutes plus 10 seconds i believe so the format is like this i will let syed talk very soon we will listen to him all together and i will stop at some key moments and i will give my feedback to syed all right and if you have time in the end i will also analyze some key positions from his game to give him some actionable advice and some feedback, basically, about my observations. So without further ado, here comes Syed analyzing one of his recent games. He was playing with white pieces, and let's go. So hello, everyone. This game was played between me with white pieces um, and a club player um, at, a, at a tournament at our club. So um, I, at the beginning, uh, I want to say something about the opening strategy that I followed. Um, I actually studied his games and I saw that he is actually e4 or d4 player. So with uh, d4 he plays actually Joe Baba London and with e4 sometimes Italian game or uh, Rui Lopez. So I decided to play something uh, else to surprise him in the opening and uh, so I decided to play English. So the game start with English, C4. So Syed, I have one question to you. You checked his games and he was an E4 or D4 player with white. And now you chose to go for C4 as white against him, right? So your logic was that if he is playing E4 or D4 with white pieces, he cannot be really well versed with one C4 structures. This was your point, I guess, right? Please let me know on YouTube comments whether this was your thought. 1c4 is definitely a very sound opening, by the way. And maybe you got him outside of his comfort zone already. Let's see how it progressed. Um, and uh, at this beginning, at the first move, uh, I was sure that I got what I actually wanted from the uh, first move, that the surprise, because it took almost uh, almost two minutes for him to take uh, the first, his first move. And then... After thinking for some time, almost two, uh, two minutes, he uh, decided to play e5. So about something about the time control, it is uh, a tournament with uh, 45 minutes for each player and 10 seconds increment on each moves. <clears throat> so at that board, uh, now we have uh, almost like a reverse uh, Sicilian and uh, now uh, my plan was simple, so I play uh, English like this, so g3. Now clearly to fear to my uh, catch my bishop. He goes uh, bishop c5. I go bishop g2. Uh, I really like this idea of uh, this white bishop uh, thing catering in this uh, English uh, because uh, sometimes uh, it becomes really uh, helpful because later on my uh, b knight uh, 
B1 knight will come out at C3 and uh, will put pressure on the white square and together that is a nice piece harmony. Um, that's why I like it. He goes knight F6. I play E3. <clears throat> Although it is a little bit slow, but I like to play in this way when the bishop is at uh, C5 because then I can actually block this bishop for any nasty ideas like early attacks, knight jumping on G G4 and attacking F two and so on oof very nice very nice Syed. i love it i also play like this as white sometimes right this is e3 is a beautiful move blocking blocking the bishop on c5 and later you can even play knight ge2 right supporting some d4 perhaps so i like this peace harmony and consolation with white against early bishop c5s in the english so i like your reasoning why you chose the move e3 here let's continue so I play this. He also goes for d6. Uh, I think uh, his idea was to play, uh, to free up the bishop and develop the white square bishop, light square bishop. And then I go knight to e2. So far, just a developing move and I want to uh, castle and uh, free up my king side and so on. This move. This move, queen to d7, I think uh, I, I evaluated this move as uh, at, the, at the board at the time as a mistake, positional mistake, because if he, uh, if black uh, at the move uh, 4, go d6 to free up his light square bishop, then why he's actually now going with queen to d7? Yes, I have to stop you here, Syed. I mean, yes, yes, I agree, 100%. Queen d7 looks like an extremely strange move, don't you think? And I like your reasoning. You explain why this move must be bad. I mean, they are blocking their bishop. They are making the queen out too early. What's the queen doing on d7? Also getting in the way of the knight. I mean, what's the point of this move? I really want to understand, folks. Please help me on comments. What could be the point of queen d7? Why does black not make the most natural moves? Like castling short, knight c6, bishop e6, something, right? I mean, what's going on here? So I very much liked how you reacted to queen d7. That's also my reaction. That must be a bad move. Let's see. I didn't get it. So I, I, I looked for some ideas like maybe queen coming to uh, some square. I do not know. Some square here at a4, but that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and some attacks or early attacks, but I couldn't find anything. So I, I thought... By the way, what's an early attack? Can you please write to me on YouTube? What is early attack? I have no idea. Um... But yeah, so I'm very curious about your reaction because you see a lemon move like queen d7 and let's see how you reacted against this move. That's uh, it's just a mistake and it is really crucial because he's really not developed and I'm almost finished with my developing. So I go knight b to c3. Simple, uh, um, simple developing move and also putting pressure and now since my knight... From G is on E2, uh, I put pressure on D4 and later on planning to uh, also push D4 myself to open up the center and putting pressure on the D, on the black bishop and uh, so that uh, his bishop actually become useless. He goes knight to C6 and common developing move, nothing fancy so far and uh, now um, I thought it's a good time to castle. He also castles. Now I want to push up and open my center and also make this black bishop uh, restrict. So my playing strategy is not really attacking rather than to constrain um, opponent's play as much as I can. So uh, his uh, pieces so, so that I can make his pieces as less useful as I can. And that's why I think so what follows. So it's d4. E takes d4, e takes d4, and now bishop have to go back because the pawn is protected by queen and the knight, uh, so it could, can be taken. Okay, stop here. Syed, I loved your reasoning. I loved how you the entire structure was set up to play for d4 to restrain the enemy bishop. Yes, you also gained central control, don't forget. Maybe you shouldn't have even, even taken on d4 because by taking on d4, he just gave you the full center, right? He exchanged his e5 pawn, central pawn for your e3 pawn. That was a bad trade probably. But still, this is beautiful 
because you get full central control, you restrict their pieces, and you see there's a traffic jam going on now in the Black's camp. Moreover, you activated your bishop on c1, right, Syed? Yes, your pawn play nicely connects to peace activity. In this position, you don't play for a kingside attack, but you play for, yeah, central control, you play principal chess with the entire setup for white, right? Peace harmony, as you mentioned. So I very much like how you're treating the game so far. You're not going crazy because the guy played queen d7, right? You're still playing principal chess. That's how we defeat chess crimes usually, yeah? You just keep on making principal move after principal move, and at some point they have to pay for such earlier mistakes. So let's see. I, I'm loving so far what I'm seeing, yeah? Let's see. Now the bishop goes back. Now, um, the position, uh, I think, I was really happy with that because I got what I wanted uh, from the opening. Uh, look at uh, his bishop, his dark square bishop is uh, right now, is not a good piece. My knight is ready to go up on the d5 square and uh, his knight is also really do not have any place to go other than uh, b4. And uh, at this moment, I was uh, thinking about uh, developing my pieces. So this knight has this potential to, uh, so c knight has this potential to go to uh, d5. And that, that uh, from that place, it would be a really, really good piece. But this, this place is actually protected by uh, black's knight as f6. So I thought what I could do. And then... I developed uh, also my only not developed piece is my uh, dark square bishop, so I developed it. Oof. So the idea was putting pressure on the knight. If the knight goes away somewhere, then I can develop my knight at d5. And uh, also, if something, something, something uh, not really correct played, then maybe I can destroy the uh, king side and open up the king side and later on put my queen there. So I have to stop here, Syed. I am loving what I'm hearing. I'm loving what I'm hearing. I loved your approach. I love your evaluation of this middle game, right? Bad pieces. You don't push d5 directly because then the knight can go to e5, right? You just want to restrain those pieces by keeping your pawn on d4. Then you looked at your bishop on c1 and you looked at that knight on f6, which is the main defender of d5, and you played it. Such a logical move. You're following chess principles to its fullest. You see? His queen side is sleeping, the bishop is blocked, the queen does nothing on d7, and now you have a threat as well. Bishop takes f6, will ruin his king side. So I'm loving this multi-purpose move, Syed. You don't directly go for premature peace trades, but you're putting pressure by playing bishop g5 first, my friend. So, so far, no major critique. I'm loving what I'm hearing so far, Syed. Let's see. Uh, so two motives, uh, first of all, putting pressure on the knight. So if the knight goes something like this, I think I can just do this. And uh, after doing this, uh, h3, either he can push up this or he has to go back with his knight. Uh, or And uh, then I can take the knight and uh, destroy the uh, king side. And at the same time, then I am ready to jump with my uh, C knight to the D5 square. That was the idea to develop my pieces. And uh, so it is all about, uh, for my playing style, it is all about uh, developing my pieces. And I, I do not think uh, it, it, I was already ready to actually attack. And uh, that is actually my playing style. Uh, so I do not go for any risky attack. I just play simply controlling chess and uh i am actually doing this uh video because i thought uh that would be really nice to have the opinion and so again i hope you like my opinion so far I'm, I'm loving what i'm seeing so far but don't restrain yourself as being this you know not attacking player if the position calls for it you can also go for an attack right like you should not limit yourself oh my my playing style is i have I just hate attacking each other no if they are provoking you then you can also go for an attack so let's see how you actually treat this middle game. Maybe there's an attacking chance later on emerges. I don't know. But don't limit yourself. But I'm loving your positional approach. I'm loving your connection between your pawns and pieces. You want to restrain the opponent's pieces so far. That's clear. And you want to activate and make every of your pieces happy. And that's generally how you beat weaker players. Yeah, By keeping it simple, basically. Like, don't force things so much. Don't complicate too much. You know, control the chaos. And slowly grind and show your positional evaluation. Let's continue. Let's go on to the next move. Uh, so the bishop is uh, my dark square bishop is now developed. 
and he goes queen to e2. E7. I think that's a mistake because now it my knight will jump. Yes, that happens. I played this. Knight to d5 and uh, now uh, queen has to move. And the king side will be king side pawn. The g7 pawn will be... Uh, um, so on the f5 the pawns will be doubled and the um, king side will be uh, actually destroyed. And I actually got what I was looking for. And uh, the knight cannot be captured of course because then the queen is hanging. So he goes to d8. Just a little comments. You see how he is destroying himself by making those queen moves. Like queen d7 was terrible and tried to fix the problem. He created another problem with queen e7. Two subtle mistakes, maybe not so subtle, but obvious mistakes. And you obtain a crushing positional advantage. Let's see how you converted your great positional advantage here, Syed. With the queen, I take with the bishop. He takes with the g pawn. And um, with this position, I was really happy with this outcome because his king is now open. My uh, queen can now jump on somehow uh, later on to this h3, a uh, six square. I'm putting pressure on the king side. My knight is good placed. He, uh, he is putting pressure on this f6 pawn, and life is good. Then I thought, I love it. Life is good. When you have a position like this, the life should feel very good indeed. I love your evaluation. At this position, uh, I was not uh, yet thinking about directly attacking his side because um, the small achievement of making the making a bad pawn structure on the king side I have achieved already. So I was thinking, how can I constrain his pieces more? Like his knight has one, his bishop cannot do anything actually. If he's come to this uh, uh, b5 square, then I will push this uh, b4 pawn. It is protected by my knight and the bishop has to go again. So his bishop is no trouble for me. His knight has one square to come on b4. Although it is not a huge uh, uh, benefit, but still I... I thought about making this knight less terrible and also I uh, making this knight more terrible sorry and also I thought uh, I did not see any um, attacking chance for black in this position I, I, I evaluated my position to be solid so I played a3 so the knight now cannot jump here now I played a3 <clears throat> wait Syed I'm loving so far what I'm hearing. You still want to restrain those pieces and gain more space on the queen side and make them even more terrible. I can even imagine this bishop can be buried later on with some b4, c5, right? We'll come back to it. Um, my hunch, I haven't checked this, but my hunch in this position is to play queen d2 instead of a3. To my mind, queen d2 is multifunctional, right? Queen d2, first of all, I, it prepares b4. b4 could be my next move. Second of all, queen d2 also hints at queen h6, right? Why not? I want to exploit those dark square weaknesses I just created. Plus, I'm connecting my rooks. Can you see it, my friend? Instead of a3, I propose queen d2. All the ideas are in the air. Multi-purpose moves. I created a chessable course about this, right? The art of multi-purpose moves. It does everything to the position. I have to check this later on, but it looks like a beautiful candidate. Having said that, a3 is not terrible either, right? I assume you will play b4, c5 to bury the bishop even more. Let's see. He plays a5. So with the a3, I had also this idea about uh, if he doesn't play well, then uh, trapping this bishop at this there. B4, later on, C5. so like if he didn't play a5, then pushing the b pawn and then later on making the c pawn forward and then trapping the bishop if he doesn't play it well. So uh, he responded to uh, make place for the bishop. <clears throat> I put my queen here. Before making this move, uh, I thought again what I can do. And uh, only piece uh, that was not yet developed was my queen. And not, with this move, I actually achieved multiple things. That is connecting my rooks, developing my queen. And also at the same time, I thought I, I have to protect this d4 pawn because it is, uh, it is uh, actually under pressure from this knight on c6 and also this bishop from b7 and it is protected by my queen and my knight at e2 
so I have to protect it. So I'm still protecting it. And at the same time, I'm also eyeing with the queen, the h6 square. Sayed, sorry, you, you said already what I just told you, right? Eh? Two minutes ago. So you had a great vision. You understood the strength of this move. So you could have also played it on the previous move, right? That would be my proposal. Because queen d2 was doing everything on the previous move too. Okay? But nothing is lost. Because your advantage is long term. Black cannot change drastically things in this position. Yeah? So you keep the advantage most probably. That was this developing plan. So nothing big, just develop faces and slowly develop. That was all along my idea. And that is also my uh, play, playing plans. Um, he develops his light square bishop. And actually, it's a huge... Oof. Guys, I'm testing your tactical vision because I saw something here. I saw a tactical resource for white after black played the move bishop e6. Can you see it? Good tactical vision, folks. The bishop and the knight are aligned like this. It's calling for the pawn fork, right? I'm seeing a nice strip-like calculation for white. That wins a piece. Let's see whether Sayed have found it. Mistake and it's a blunder. Yes. What follows? Actually, this was the decisive moment of the game. Uh, to be honest, when he develops his light square bishop, developed his light square bishop, I didn't see the uh, tactic here huh. at, at the first moment. Uh, and then I thought, oh, he was just developing his bishop. And what uh, what should I do now? So it, it is logical. So uh, I thought it, it is logical because he's putting pressure on this good knight and want to trade it for this bishop. And... Um, after trading, uh, then my pawn structure here would be uh, bad and so on and so forth. And this bishop uh, actually now can move because it was a bad bishop at c, uh, c8. And um, also my best piece, this knight, would be lost. So I was thinking something about jumping with the e2 knight to f4 square and protecting the knight. And if he takes, then I can take with my knight and replace the knight. But that comes with the problem that this pawn the is hanging. not... Yes. Uh, any more protected and he can take this pawn. So I thought something about it and then I recognized the pattern that knight and the bishop actually are separated by a pawn and my pawn is actually uh, on the middle file. So uh, if somehow I can put my pawn here, then it's a fork and the game is actually over. And luck habit has it, I have the chance to do that. So I take with my... With so my best piece for this bad bishop maybe looks weird, but here comes the tactic. So he takes with his uh, c pawn now fork. So forking the bishop and the knight. And um, first of all, Zayed, beautiful reverse engineering your way. You first spot the tactical pattern, then you found a way to achieve it. You said luck has it. I disagree. Because chess in chess, usually tactics support good positions. In other words, tactics flow from superior positions. So it was not like a random luck that you have this tactic. You had positional domination with great pieces and tactics favored you at that point, right? So it's not like a lucky dumb mistake, basically, or like a random luck that gave way to this. He was suffering in terms of terrible pieces. And the logical looking move, bishop e6, could not help him because of your superior pieces and that central pawn on d4. You see the effect of it, right? You had a central pawn, he didn't. And your central pawn on d4 punished him in two moves. You see, chess is a very logical game side. Once you build up your position logically like that, then something will happen. And those tactics will favor you. So it's great. If I were you, I would also yeah, spend more time on such tactical training because... You're a good position player so far, from what I've seen so far. So you will have such opportunities in your games more and more. So if you build on your tactics and calculation skills, then you will also convert those positional advantages into victories, my friend. Let's continue. So at this point, um, he, it took him a longer time because I think he was deciding to keep, uh, decided to keep the bishop or the knight. And then he decided to keep the bishop, although I thought keeping the knight would make more sense because after this, 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 he lose a pawn. And that is actually what we played at the board. He goes with the rook, uh, uh, rook to uh, c8 to attacking my bishop. 
I protect my pawn and also protect the bishop and now look at this. As always, bishop and pawn protecting each other is also a nice combo and they protect each other really good. So you cannot break it. So you have to say... Said nice. You are talking about the crystal formation, the bishop and the pawn. They are protecting each other. I love it. Your bishop on d5 is also a very good piece. So it's a very good move. Sacrifice other than you cannot break it or you have to attack with this uh, nah, um, pawn. Then I can push my b pawn and then life is good again. And also I'm restricting this pawn to move. And his bishop is resisting his double pawn to move and life is really good. And at this point, nothing to worry. He goes there to attack my rook. I go rook e1. Then he drops his queen. I think he was connecting his rooks. I do not know what he was actually thinking. And we did not get any chance to after the game talk because uh, there was no chance. I go queen h6. To pit pressure on the king side and I thought uh, the time is ready to start my attack because my king side is solid, my pieces are developed and everything is going well for me. So my idea was going to the queen side, uh, going to the king side, attacking the black king and somehow uh, develop this knight to f4 square, then go to h6 square and... Beautiful, Syed. You start organizing your pieces towards king side weaknesses. Yes, queen h6 is a beautiful move, also puts pressure on the bishop on h3, and you prepare knight f4 to h5, right? I can see you can mate the black king in a few moves here. You are the one who's attacking, obviously, right? Your king is much safer. As they say, you have extra piece plus compensation as well. Let's see how you converted this. And then the game is over. This is also a blunder, I think. I do not know why he moved his uh, uh, rook to d8. Uh, maybe he was seeing some ghost at this point. Um, because at this point he was taking a longer time to move his pieces. Now I go knight f4. Attacking at the same time uh, the bishop uh, on h3. Uh, and also eyeing the uh, h5 square. So he moves his bishop uh, at f5, which is also a mistake. Only, I think, saving move, what I was hoping, uh, I was actually right. expecting him to do is bishop g4. Right. It, it actually stopped knight uh, h5. Um, not for a long time. I can sacrifice my bishop uh, and so on. But uh, anyway, um, he didn't go at, he played, and then I jumped with my knight at h6, uh, uh, h5. And uh, I think so I am threatening now to either to fork the queen and the king or to checkmate. So no way it could the game could be saved now. Yep. He goes queen a4 and I win with the checkmate. So a note is that right now after reviewing this game, I see that even at this position, I, as I mentioned, I want to... I love to play safe and really gradual developing games, no no risk taking and so on and so forth. That's why sometimes I also lose. I I I, I confess, but uh, at for example, I think at this position, if I actually went with my queen to sorry, actually went to, with my queen to directly here, it should. I do not know if what engine says about it. This should have also be good for me. Like this continuation, mm. I think it's not a bad continuation. I, I considered that during the play, but the way I played, I uh, I felt uh, more comfortable and there is no risk how I played it. I thought actually and uh, uh, solidly and without taking any risk. And Yes, Syed, in that position, I would not even bother myself with calculating such forcing lines involving material sacrifice. I mean, you have an extra bishop plus a much safer king, right? In two moves, you'll get your pieces to the king's side. I mean, there's zero risk to be taken, yeah? It's like metacognition. There is no need for any risk. So you don't need to, like, suffer in those calculations too much in that position, I would say. Because you see that rook e1 is a very natural move. Even you can lift the rook later on, on e4 and g4 and so on, right? It just helps you. Plus, your king is very safe. They can't mate you. Look at your bishop on d5. Every, every single light square around your, around your king is covered. So... Just take a step back, right? Make natural moves. Don't like spend so much time in a position like that as well. Yeah, just make rookie one and queen eight six. The game is already finished by normal moves in that position. So I would also probably not bother myself with this, you know, line that involves a sacrifice, basically. Why should I, you know?
there is zero risk to be taken here. So I agree with your decision here, actually. So what? We can go here, and I can go here, and I do not see any more defense from this. So anyway, yeah. but the game didn't go on this way. The game went on this way. I saved my hook, and so taking out all the plays and so on and so yeah. forth. So I think that's it, uh, and um, I would really love to hear your comment about it uh, and uh, to learn more from you um, because, of course, uh, um, you are a coach. And thank you very much for your work, and um, bye-bye. Thank you so much, Syed. It was a great victory. I love it. And now I'll go to the board to show you maybe a couple of key ideas that I observed in this game. See you then. Let's have a very quick look at Syed's game in a couple of observations that I had about, about this game overall. Queen d7 was, of course, quite bad. And I very much like how Syed treated this middle game. He has a plan. The entire structure for white is designed for his d4 push. And his justification was also correct. Because here, those pieces are cramped. And this knight is a little bit unstable. And he just plays naturally. Right? That's how you beat those those structures basically, when they are playing unprincipled chess, when they are giving you the full center like that, when they are making some weird moves, usually the most principled reactions are the best. And after queen e7, Syed's tactical vision is quite good, with some short calculations like that, using some short tactics, he gets a better position, right? He transforms the advantage now to something long term, because the king is weak, forever weak on the king side, and white's a beautiful knight on d5. Here, Syed plays a3. I would say queen d2 is better here because it gives us everything that Syed was asking for plus these ideas. I guess we're about to win the game with queen h6, yeah? I mean, how, how does he even stop that? If queen h6 is on the board, I mean, it just collapses, yeah? Plus b4 is coming. Maybe king g7, let's say, try to stop queen h6, but then we can go b4, right? Now we can go b4. What's the point? Well, I want to go c5 and bury your bishop, right? Look at this. After c5, your bishop is oh, terrible on a7. So I loved Syed's vision about this position. On the next move, he plays queen d2 with the idea of shutting down that bishop with b4, c5, and so on. So it's great. It's a great middle game understanding that is actually happening here, right? Because now the bishop is buried. You don't need to worry about your d4 pawn, which means you can actually activate the other knight. Maybe knight h5 is in the air. And I looked at some lines. Just black cannot hold this position, right? I mean, knight f6 is coming. Queen a6 is coming. It's disaster for black. What did we do to achieve this? Nothing much. We simply played principal chess. Syed plays a3. Nothing is lost because we have a long-term advantage. And here I love it, yeah, Syed. Your little un petit combinaisons, little tactical eye to exploit this move bishop e6. It's not like a random luck tactic because we have a beautiful central pawn, beautiful pieces, and we are using the alignment problem that black has just created, right? By this little tactic. Again, three-ply calculation and white wins a piece. So it's also very good for all of you guys to get better at tactical patterns. Because now, after bishop e6, those pieces are aligned like that, which is allowing you a pawn fork. And Syed reverse engineer his way to achieve the pawn fork, and the game is completely over in this position, plus a pawn, beautiful bishop, and our king is safe. Here, Syed was maybe contemplating such more forcing moves that involve some sacrifices. But I would say again, I would probably not bother with this either, right? I mean, maybe you can even do this, queen d7 to defend, right? If you go bishop b4, maybe f5s and so on, although now we can actually do this. I mean, you know my point, right? Like, we don't even need to bother calculating those lines. Having said that, maybe queen h6 is actually just forcing finished, indeed. This should be checked more carefully, obviously. But yeah. I would probably not bother with this. I mean, you can even maybe leave turn back if it comes down to it, you know, maybe some defense, some squares. I very much liked how you reacted, Syed, yeah? No risk to be taken. Your king is very safe. Look at your bishop, right? And you basically play normal chess. Normal chess. Every single piece is now coming to the king side. Why? Because weaknesses lie on the king side. It's as simple as that. But yeah, don't limit yourself with uh, only, let's say, positional chess. Don't tell yourself that you're bad at attacking chess, you know. If the position calls for it, you can also go for it, as you did in this position, right? You got those weaknesses on the king side, and then you played for mate. You just mated the guy, right? In like 24 moves. 
And finally, after you play d4, as I said, he should not have taken on d4 side, right? This looks like innocent move, but in fact, that's a big mistake, right? I made a course about this. Chess, crime, and punishment. By taking on d4, black is exchanging their central pawn for the pawn on e3. It's as simple as that, right? His central pawn is gone, and you replace the pawn with your e3 pawn, which means your bishop on c1 has become a vacant. That was a huge mistake for black. That's a very instructive error, actually, from black's perspective. And we can learn a lot from such errors, guys. E takes d4, gives up the center, activates the bishop, and Syed achieves beautiful and simple advantage here. That's how you beat weaker players too, right? You play normal chess and they destroy themselves. It's as simple as that, right? You give them choices and they destroy themselves by making unprincipled moves and some chess crimes. Thank you so much, Syed, for sending this game to me, for taking your time and analyzing your game. Although you sent me really a great game, Syed, it was hard for me to find the clear mistakes. So maybe you can later on analyze some of your losses and send it to me because we can also learn a lot from our own mistakes and our losses. Okay? But it was great. And I also loved your explanations, the why questions, why is behind your moves. It was beautiful to see. And you're a very good positional player, as you say, but don't limit yourself with that. Also see some tall games, some sacrificial games. I made several videos about this on YouTube, right? Learning to sacrifice, playlist, attacking chess and so on. Get better at calculation and you will gain more confidence in dealing with such chaotic positions that involve, you know, concrete calculation. Super nice. I hope this wasn't too long, by the way, folks. Did you like this format? If you liked it, please give me feedback and write to me on YouTube. Do you like this series to continue? Then you're welcome to record yourself and send it the video to me with some explanations, with some nice touch, nice observations about your games. And I will do my best to react to your games. And also, I will also give this, you know, overall summary and show you some ideas and lines at the end. I don't want this to, to go for too long. So I will just stop here for today. I hope you like the format. And if you liked it, folks, please give me a like and subscribe. That's very important for me to be able to produce similar content for you. I'm here to help you improve your game. I'm doing this to help your chess because analyzing our games is one of the most effective ways to improve. Waiting for your feedback on YouTube. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.